Today I want to talk about the relationship between risk and law. And I want to do this in the context of the history of agriculture and regulating pesticides during the 20th century. And also I want to have you consider the idea of, of risk. And I'm uh, reminded uh, as I think about this of T.S. Eliot's line, only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. So <laughs> many believe that environmentalists are in the business of trying to absolutely minimize risk as opposed to balance uh, the threat of loss or danger against other opportunities. And others argue that without risk in life, things would be pretty boring. <clears throat> I was traveling through uh, Europe last summer on a lecture tour, and I saw this village sitting on the top of a cliff. And I wondered to myself about the village, and I wondered how they chose to build so close to the edge, and what kind of thinking was in their minds. And I could imagine that uh, this used to be a, a number of <clears throat> fields where they grazed cattle and, and sheep, and they probably worried about uh, losing cattle and sheep across the cliff. Then as it grew into a little village, I can imagine them worried about their children playing near the edge. So much of environmental law is about thinking about the buffer zone or the safety factor that you would want to use to offer sufficient, sufficient protection against significant damage. So the idea of risk and understanding risk is really a fundamental aspect of human logic and instinct. Within law, it tends to become defined as probability of loss, probability of damage. Uh, it might be an endangered species, it might be uh, air quality, it could be human health. <clears throat> and it's often expressed in both quantitative and qualitative terms. So particularly over the past 30 years, the field of quantitative risk assessment has grown in importance uh, to try to understand what happens to chemicals or to species, uh, what kinds of uh, pathways they travel, uh, what, what kinds of problems uh, might occur from uh, chemical release and chemical movement. And increasingly, uh, it's more sophisticated mathematically and more difficult to understand the different sources of uncertainty that are embedded in these estimates of risk. You may have heard of, of the idea of a, uh, an acceptable risk level for cancer or some, or some other undesirable outcome as being one in a million. Well, the government has used that standard on many occasions. A one in a million excess risk. Well, to put that into perspective, you might think about the H1N1 infection. So what was the actual uh, morbidity rate uh, over the past year uh, for H1N1? Well, it turns out that uh, you, you would first think about uh, the number of people in the United States, you know, say roughly 300 million people. And you'd want to know what the incidence rate was in the illness. And those now, I was looking at them last night on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website. Their estimate is that uh, between 30 and, and 45 or 50 million people uh, uh, carried the virus and uh, had some adverse effect from it. And then I was looking at the statistics for mortality. And between 15 and, and 20,000 people uh, might be uh, or, or, or were killed uh, by the illness. Why the uncertainty associated with the estimate? Well, uh, it's, a, it's an illness that uh, uh, can harvest, so to speak, in epidemiological terms, uh, the more susceptible, those that have serious background illnesses. So the expression of risk for morbidity, which means illness, would be you know, roughly, let's say, uh, 30 million out of uh, uh, 300 million, uh, which is really quite striking. You know, there are few illnesses that uh, uh, have, that, have that rate. So you know, roughly a 1 in 10 risk. And I mentioned when I started this uh, brief aside uh, that a 1 in a million risk is often thought of as acceptable. The distinction between environmental risks uh, that are not biologically based or, or uh, generated by pathogens like uh, uh, H1N1 and chemical risks is often that uh, there is a clear causal relationship between exposure, uh, and an understanding of the source of the illness 
and also <clears throat> what might be done to manage it more effectively, such as the vaccine. By the way, the vaccine uh, that was produced and distributed this year was really pretty remarkable. It was extremely effective, uh, and <clears throat> the, the uh, incidence rate was projected to be far higher than it actually turned out. So <clears throat> this concern over quantitative risk assessment, trying to understand who's most vulnerable, who's going to uh, uh, basically sustain the, the, the uh, uh, most serious effects, this preoccupies uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Food and Drug Administration, when they're thinking about uh, uh, allowing a new drug to be added to the marketplace. Uh, and really, the decision is all about balancing, uh, trying to think through what the, the quality of the ev evidence is and should the dangers be balanced against the benefits. And this standard for balancing has shifted dramatically over the 20th century. So that uh, the lecture today really will trace the evolution of law uh, and <clears throat> demonstrate how it's shifted from 1906 to the present. And I want you to think about how it really reflects changing science uh, as well as changing human values. So that as the science gets uh, stronger, we understand the relationship between uh, an exposure and an adverse outcome. Uh, and oftentimes, the government will intervene by setting a new law or a new regulation. So that back in 1906, uh, the food, drug, and, or the, uh, um, uh, let me just jump, jump ahead here. The Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 was passed after Upton Sinclair published The Jungle that described the filthy slaughtering conditions in, in Chicago. The Pure Food and Drug Act was passed in, in uh, 1906 as well, and it forbade foreign and interstate commerce in adulterated or fraudulently labeled uh, food and drugs. So products could now be seized and condemned, and offending persons could be fined or jailed, uh, and fresh, canned, or frozen food shipped in interstate commerce must be pure and wholesome. That was the new standard back in 1906. So basically, the idea of adulteration uh, and the idea of fraudulent labeling became important. So the very first attempts to try to control uh, risk in society uh, related to food and agriculture uh, really concentrated on the idea of labeling, uh, the idea of, of making sure that the product in, inside the package was what it claimed to be, uh, and that it had an effectiveness that uh, was also claimed, and that it wasn't uh, excessively dangerous. They really worried about farmers buying uh, pesticides, supposed pesticides, uh, and then basically uh, uh, <clears throat> having the container filled with sugar or flour. Uh, how would they know the difference? Uh, there were many cases of, of fraudulent manufacturing practices early in the, in the 20th century before this law was put into, into place. Another uh, critical statute that uh, built on this was the Insecticide Act of 1910 uh, that similarly pro prohibited uh, uh, fraudulently labeled pesticides uh, and set standards for purity. Uh, so the idea of ingredient labeling uh, was added to the Insecticide Act. And it was designed to protect uh, farmers from uh, dangerous and impotent pe uh, pesticides. If you jump forward, you find that the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938 is important. And it became the, uh, it came, became the home for pesticide regulation for, for many years uh, <clears throat> until uh, uh, EPA took over that responsibility in 1970. And the Food and Drug Administration was authorized to set, in 1938, uh, limits for chemicals in food. So the recognition that if you uh, sprayed a field of corn and uh, you harvested the corn uh, and then you, you uh, <coughs> sold it in the supermarket that it might still carry residues, this was beginning to, to be well recognized back in the 1930s. The criteria used to set the tolerances <coughs> was really quite interesting at that time. It wasn't a health-based criterion. It wasn't an environmentally-based criterion. It was how much residue uh, <coughs> should be allowed to, to uh, 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 remain on the food product if the chemical is sprayed in the field at a dose that's effective to get the job done, in other words, to kill the pest. So that's kind of interesting. So it was really uh, a standard that was set to make sure that the residues would not cause the food to be pulled out of the, the marketplace because they were adulterated. <clears throat> so they were really designed to protect the farmer uh, and the economic value of the crop rather than the health of the population or, or uh, the environmental quality. The Miller Amendment of 1954 <clears throat> required tolerances for all pesticides uh, if they might remain as food residues. Uh, 
And then the Delaney Amendment in 1958 became infamous because it set a zero risk standard, uh, a tolerance <clears throat> for carcinogens in food. So the, the exact language is that if a, a pesticide or other food additive uh, is carcinogenic in laboratory animals or in humans, that was the first time in law <clears throat> that, that uh, using evidence from laboratory animals was considered to be sufficient in order to uh, ban the use of a chemical, <clears throat> then it could not uh, be used in a way that would cause the residue to uh, be present in the food supply. Now you can imagine that uh, these chemicals were applied to, uh, to many different crops and uh, I mentioned to you that, that uh, DDT uh, in my last lecture was applied so heavily to so many different foods. Uh, 300 different food crops had uh, tolerances by the mid-1950s. <clears throat> but the government's ability to detect these chemicals is really important to this story. So if you use insensitive detection technology, in other words, uh, supposing that uh, your, your uh, chemical detection equipment is only capable of finding residues at the uh, uh, part per uh, 100,000 level, 10 to the minus fifth, uh, <clears throat> or even part per million level, and the chemical is there, but it's there at the high part per billion level, uh, the chemical test is going to come back negative. It's going to come back as a non-detect. So gradually you see this uh, uh, very interesting evolution in the concept of, of purity and, and what constitutes a safe and pure environment that's very much driven by the sensitivity of the detection equipment. So during the century, as the, as the detection equipment became more and more sensitive, now for some dioxins, we can detect those down to the uh, part per quadrillion level. And many chemicals are, are present in food at the uh, part per trillion level. It's got people thinking about, uh, well, what does that mean? What does that mean uh, to, to uh, uh, their potential to influence human health? So back in the 40s and 50s, the detection technology was really quite limited. And also the sampling was quite limited, so that they really weren't sampling that many foods. You can imagine the, the, the scale of the problem this presents today, given the international character of our food supply. And I asked this question with respect to uh, several commodities. Uh, first, I started with apples and wondered how many times the government tested apples for, for pesticides. Uh, and then I looked at uh, bananas. And for bananas, for a chemical that was, uh, when I looked about uh, eight years ago, one of the most heavily used uh, insecticides on bananas, uh, you know, grown in, in the tropics, the government was looking uh, at uh, uh, about uh, 15 to uh, 18 samples of bananas uh, for this compound uh, when uh, I then was able to calculate that several trillion individual bananas had been imported into the nation uh, during that year. So, you know, one needs to think about uh, uh, what standards are in place in different parts of the world, uh, where that food is likely to go, uh, keeping records of import statistics, and then think about what kind of a sampling design would be necessary in order to find these residues uh, in a way that uh, might eventually lead to health protection. So the Delaney Amendment uh, was really quite striking. It was uh, adopted uh, really uh, uh, with great support in Congress, uh, in part because of the U.S. fascination with cancer and also cancer management. So uh, this grew in part because of the nuclear weapons testing era, uh, but it is curious that uh, within the European nations, uh, the regulatory approach to environmental quality has not been as concerned with cancer. It's been more concerned with uh, neurological decline and also reproductive health. Uh, so it raises really interesting questions about why the preoccupation in the United States with cancer. So the first seriously health protective statute uh, that uh, we can find in environmental law has to do with food and it has to do with pesticides and it's contained in this Delaney Amendment. By the way, this amendment applies to all food additives, and a food additive could be in, uh, defined also as a coloring agent, like the uh, salmon coloring I spoke of. It could be defined as a uh, packaging material migrant. Uh, it could be a flavoring agent as well, uh, so that the standard is, is very clear. If it induces cancer in, in animals or in humans, uh, then it is not allowed. <laughs> Curiously, there's a clause within the statute that <laughs> applies only to pesticides uh, that are defined as food additives if they concentrate. And you remember the story I told you the other day about uh, taking a, a grape and extracting all the water out of it, or taking a, a corn and extracting the oil out of it, and uh, having to be thoughtful about uh, what that really might mean for, for chemical residues. 
So if you, if you uh, are concerned about oil extraction, uh, you need to, to think about lipophilicity. So if you've got a chemical such as a uh, chlorinated carbon that is likely to bind on to, to fats of, of one form or another, extracting the oil out will likely also concentrate the chemical residue. So if you look uh, in the Code of Federal Regulations, it's very curious. You can go over to the law library and pull out the Code of Federal Regulations on pesticides. It's actually a good, it would be a good assignment for uh, teaching fellows to, to uh, uh, disseminate. Uh, go look at the Code of Fe Federal Re Regulations for Pesticide Residues in Food, and you'll see uh, 40 CFR uh, 135, and you go to the appendix, and the appendix is several hundred pages long of individual pesticide food combinations. So I was quite struck by this uh, uh, several years ago, and I added all of these up, and it turns out that there are about 10,000 different pesticide food combinations. And if you look carefully at these combinations, uh, that set limits for Benamil and bananas or, or uh, say, chlorpyrifos in, in uh, uh, apples or DDT in, in milk. Uh, that standard is still in place, by the way. It's kind of interesting, even though DDT was uh, banned, as I, I said the other day, in, in uh, the 1970s. But if you look carefully, you'll see that you get a different residue limit allowed for fresh corn or fresh apples or fresh soybeans than you do for the processed product. And it's basically because of this concentration factor. So water extraction, you know, making raisins out of grapes, uh, ma making uh, wine out of grapes, uh, or making oils out of uh, uh, different kinds of grains uh, can have this effect. <clears throat> the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act of 1947 was the uh, central uh, statute that was, was passed, and it really set the stage uh, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's authority uh, to issue licenses or registrations. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the idea of registering a pesticide or allowing it to be used for a certain crop, uh, this, these registrations were given out one after another, after another, uh, decade after decade, so that by uh, 1960 there were 50,000 different pesticide registrations uh, that, that had been issued, and by 1970 there were nearly 70,000 pesticide registrations. And a registration is given for a specific chemical use, and it may be also assigned for a specific package. <clears throat> so the, uh, you may <clears throat> uh, have chemical X, uh, and that has a, one registration, and then it may be sold also with chemical Y or chemical Y and Z, and they would have different registrations assigned to them. And they might have different registrations assigned for uh, different kinds of uses. So that these chemicals were not just used on, on food commodities, uh, where else might they be used? Well, you think about it. Uh, many, of, uh, many of the buildings in, at, at Yale are sprayed by pesticides indoors. Uh, so that type of use often had to have a separate registration. Sprayed in subways, sprayed in uh, vehicles, added to materials such as plastics that uh, are components of cars uh, or that uh, uh, are components of urethanes, for example, that coat the, the wood here. So that uh, plastics uh, uh, have carried uh, biocides into our environment in a whole set of ways. And the government had to keep track of where these chemicals were uh, going and had to license each of these distinctive uh, uses. So the, the FIFRA of 1947 uh, was important because it defined these chemicals as economic poisons, uh, implying, yes, they're poisonous, uh, but they also carry an economic benefit so that uh, we need to, to look at this in a, uh, using a utilitarian balancing standard uh, so that risk-benefit balancing became the phrase uh, that, that guided U.S. Department, uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, to crank out these, these registrations. <clears throat> it also extended the re regulations not just to insecticides but to herbicides and rodenticides. And right now in terms of volume of chemical released in the world, you find that herbicides are the most heavily uh, type of pesticide. So there are pesticides, there are insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides designed to kill uh, rats or, or mice, uh, slimicides that are applied to uh, kill slime and algae on the side of nuclear power plant cooling, cooling towers. Uh, there are nearly a hundred different chemicals. Uh, any swimmers in the, in the room? Well, probably a few or former swimmers. Uh, well, there are nearly a hundred different pesticides that have been registered for use in swimming pools. Uh, to kill a variety of uh, viruses, bacteria, uh, as well as, as molds and, and other pathogens. And <coughs> if you uh, uh, think about that uh, uh, carefully and you, you think about the relative risk, uh, 
uh, that is associated with using those chemicals as opposed to not using them, uh, it's probably a really good choice uh, given the illnesses that uh, could, could live in that environment. So that <clears throat> uh, this statute uh, was, was the first uh, to really break down these different categories of biocides and really assign different regulatory responsibility. No authority uh, was given to the Department of Agriculture, however, to remove hazardous chemicals from the marketplace so that they always found that the benefits outweighed the risk. There are no instances that I can point to uh, that the Department of Agriculture uh, either banned a chemical uh, or found that the risk was uh, too serious. They may have adjusted the allowable use rates or, or the type, type of environment it could be released to or the type of crop, uh, but uh, no product bans. And think about this. The government gave, the Congress gave the Department of Agriculture the authority to manage this program, to implement the program. Now, is that a good idea? What's the Department of Agriculture's basic role? Well, it's really to promote economic production of a variety of different agricultural commodities. And they really also do not have uh, and have not had much expertise in environmental science to know what happened to the chemicals once they were released or, or to, to uh, uh, think carefully about the health effects. Uh, so the medical expertise at, within the Department of Agriculture uh, throughout their, their period of jurisdiction, uh, which ended in 1970 when the Environmental Protection Agency was formed, uh, was a period when they really had uh, very little expertise in environmental science or in medical science, which is really fundamental to uh, the way that we're thinking about regulating pesticides today. The FIFRA amendments in uh, 1964 came after Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, uh, raised the alarm and, and caused uh, uh, the population to be quite upset about pesticide residues, uh, particularly their effect on wildlife, uh, but also growing uh, recognition that, that these chemicals uh, could build in the human body, and also the Food and Drug Administration's ad admission uh, that, that uh, they had found pesticides in human breast milk as early uh, as 1952. The public wasn't uh, uh, warned about this, uh, and <clears throat> basically, if you find uh, a chemical, uh, regardless of what it is, you find it in uh, another uh, species of mammal's breast milk, uh, you can presume that it's likely to get into human breast milk as well. So Rachel Carson's Silent Spring turned out to be a real watershed, not just uh, legally for pesticides, because it, it uh, really it increased the, the sense of susceptibility uh, to, to biocides or the economic poisons. Uh, <clears throat> but it uh, really met with quite a bit of resistance in Congress. Uh, again, this was the end of the nuclear uh, weapons testing era in the, in the atmosphere, and <clears throat> it was also a period of great unrest uh, in the United States, the, the, the origin of the uh, uh, civil rights movement uh, may be uh, traced to this period, <clears throat> the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, recall that. Also we were, we were getting more deeply embedded in the war in Vietnam at that point in time, and environmentalism was uh, growing up, uh, uh, creeping up on the agenda. Uh, but it was really quite an interesting period. Congress, however, was preoccupied, uh, other than making some minor revisions to the statute that uh, in included adding these words, caution, warning, and hazard, depending upon the relative toxicity. This didn't really help very much because of public uh, confusion about what those phrases meant. <clears throat> and the Department of Agriculture secretary uh, was given authority finally to remove pesticides from the market uh, based upon a finding of imminent hazard uh, to the public. Now, EPA was created in 1970, uh, and it was given the responsibility to manage pesticides, and it was consolidated from other agencies. Some 15 or 16 different uh, subunits of different agencies were pulled together to create, to create EPA back in 1970, including the Department of Agriculture that had formerly had the pesticide uh, management responsibility. So you can imagine, you know, an entire uh, uh, <coughs> sub-bureaucracies picking up and moving their uh, materials to EPA. And uh, the, the stories uh, from some of the early administrators about uh, uh, how they did this and, and what the effect was are really quite striking. Uh, they described that uh, the Department of Agriculture had kept files on individual chemicals. They were completely disorganized, uh, often just handwritten, uh, often with no environmental science data, uh, often no testing of, of chemical presence in, in uh, uh, different commodities that it had been a lic license to be used on. <coughs> and uh, some chemicals had no data at all. So EPA was in this situation of becoming immediately responsible 
for 70,000 different pesticide registrations. Uh, the public was quite concerned about uh, these residues getting into their bodies and into the environment and the wildlife effects. Uh, so they felt a lot of heat. And increasingly, environmental laws had these uh, citizen suit provisions. So EPA was getting sued in the early 1970s. And they got sued on, on uh, a variety of compounds such as DDT and Aldrin and Dieldrin. And <clears throat> they were forced to go back and look at the data that they had available. And they found that they really had uh, very little data <clears throat> to justify many of these registrations. But the law was set up that forced them to look at, at uh, this problem chemical at a time. So if you've got 70,000 different uh, chemicals and the law requires that you look at them one at a time and you've got a staff that doesn't have the basic data in place, this basically put the regulatory process in deep freeze. So uh, how would you manage that uh, if you were responsible? Well, Congress thought about this and they allocated more and more money to the Environmental Protection Agency and EPA became much more aggressive and started banning chemicals. They banned DDT first, and then Aldrin, and then Dieldrin, and Heptachlor, and then Chlorodane. All of these were the chlorinated hydrocarbons. The FIFRA amendments of 1975 uh, gave the Secretary of Agriculture authority to uh, be notified of pending cancellations, uh, which meant that he was given a voice uh, to oppose cancellations. Uh, but uh, the Environmental Protection Agency really became uh, the, the stewards for, for uh, uh, human health and, and environmental quality. Uh, so that the Secretary of Ag Agriculture's voice was diminishing in the 1970s. Uh, Congress also recognized that, boy, you know, EPA is not making much progress on this sea of chemicals, so they better do something about it. They mandated that each chemical had to be reviewed within a nine-year deadline. Well, EPA was not able to, to accomplish that, so the 70s and the 80s and 90s are all great examples uh, of what I call uh, the rule of 20. Uh, that each chemical uh, might get some attention every 20 years. But what does that mean? Uh, you can think about the fact that uh, new chemicals are being added to the marketplace, uh, new registrations are being issued, uh, the data are lousy, and uh, EPA is taking 20 years to review a single chemical. Uh, that doesn't make sense. The science is evolving at a, at a uh, lightning pace on uh, where the chemicals are in the environment, uh, or what the health effects are, uh, or what the effects on different species are. And EPA is like this uh, ship that is uh, uh, frozen. It's, uh, it's icebound, uh, unable to move with a speed that, that it really need, needed to. Well, this was recognized by the National Academy of Sciences uh, in two, two publications that I had a chance to work on. Uh, one regulating pesticides in food uh, that really critiqued the Delaney paradox. And uh, <clears throat> a, a bunch of us thought that uh, the, the zero risk standard as it had been interpreted by the Food and Drug Administration uh, really did not make much sense. Uh, FDA had, had interpreted zero risk to mean uh, a little bit of risk. So uh, de minimis is the phrase that uh, uh, it used. And de minimis means a trivial amount of risk. And they define that generally as a one in a million uh, risk threshold. <clears throat> so that uh, uh, this was a, a, a curious experience for me because it was my first uh, uh, ex ex exploration of uh, the human diet and it, its variability. So uh, I started pouring through food intake surveys, uh, which is the reason that I asked a section on Monday night to keep track of uh, just one day of your own diet. You know, think about that. Uh, uh, what foods do you eat as a way of thinking about uh, uh, how patterns in your diet might lead to predictable patterns of, of your exposure to residues that had been allowed by government. So uh, in this case, uh, we were looking only at that subset of chemicals uh, that uh, had some evidence of carcinogenicity so that these chemicals induced cancer in, in animals or were known to induce can cancer in humans. And we were thinking particularly about how cancer risk might add up across the chemicals. So 100 different chemicals uh, that are, are, are cancer inducing in laboratory experiments. How would you deal with that issue of risk additivity? Would, would it be possible that uh, uh, there may be a negative effect on risk if you had two chemical exposures at the same time. Well, scientists uh, have found some cases where that actually occurred, where a lower risk chemical is able to bind onto a, a site in a cell and prevent a higher risk chemical from doing the same thing. In other cases, there's a synergistic relationship, so that uh, <coughs> the, the, the risk is not just additive, uh, but if you're exposed to chemical A and then chemical B, uh, you've got a higher risk of, of getting cancer. So 
<coughs> working with a bunch of specialists in, in uh, cancer as well as specialists in, in residue chemistry and exposure uh, analysis, uh, we came up with uh, a, a not too uh, complimentary picture of the way that EPA had regulated carcinogens in the food <coughs> and recommended also that uh, they pay much more attention to the individual diet. Uh, that the diet uh, was the, uh, likely to be the key route of exposure uh, to uh, a variety of different chemicals. The second book uh, flowed from the first uh, by the National Academy of Sciences called Pesticides in the Diets of Infants and Children. And uh, this focused on a finding inside the Red Book, uh, the finding that there's a lot of variability out there in the diets that uh, people eat that, that, that is quite predictable. So if you're Italian, uh, you're likely to eat more tomato products. Uh, if you're Latino, you're likely to eat more corn products. Uh, if you are uh, uh, an African-American from the southern part of the United States, uh, people generally eat more greens. Uh, if you are living in California, you're going to eat more fresh produce than you would if you live in the Northeast. Uh, its uh, its <coughs> cost does not go up the way that it does in the Northeast. So diet varied uh, by season. Uh, it varied by region of the country. Uh, it varies by age. Uh, and it also varies quite a bit by ethnicity. So if you don't understand these differences in dietary patterns, you really don't have much hope of, of understanding the variability in the chemical matrix that these individual diets might convey uh, into your body. So <clears throat> it also presents a really kind of an interesting idea that you could use cropping patterns as a way of predicting uh, which chemicals make their way uh, into certain environments. So if, if uh, you were looking at uh, the effect of corn on environmental quality in the United States, corn production, uh, you, you'd want to know where is it planted, predominantly in the Midwestern part of the U.S. Uh, ground zero is, is uh, uh, pretty much uh, Iowa uh, through Ohio and Pennsylvania. And uh, if, <coughs> if you map out uh, the, the pattern of chemical use, you'll see that uh, herbicides are applied much more intensely uh, in this area than in other parts of the nation. Uh, and that explains why herbicide residues are detectable uh, in the water supplies of uh, nearly 30 million people in the United States and also in, in uh, human tissues. Uh, so that this understanding of dietary diversity turned out to be extremely important uh, because it had been completely ne neglected by environmental law. And it, uh, the diversity in patterns of exposure uh, in environmental law is something that uh, uh, I became curious about and wondered about whether or not you'd find the same thing relative to uh, drinking water. Would you find the same issue relative to air quality? Uh, are there pockets of high exposure out there in the population that could be predictable uh, that would make environmental law and regulation able to focus in a way that was more effective? And the answer is yes. Uh, so as we, we look across cases over the next, uh, next couple of uh, weeks, we'll see the same pattern emerging that once you understand variability in the, in the diet, in other words, once you focus in and you, you look for uh, you know, pockets of uh, high exposure, high uh, consumption of corn or high consumption of a, a certain cluster of foods, or you look at uh, certain populations such as athletes uh, that have a higher respiration rate than, than uh, non-athletes do, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that because of that higher respiration rate, uh, they're going to absorb more, more chemicals that are present in the, in the air. So uh, across a whole array of different kinds of environmental problems that are managed by law, there's basically, uh, there had been neglect of this issue of variability. So how do you take a body of law, <clears throat> such as the body that I just described to you for uh, these chemicals, and transform it to be more sensitive uh, to the reality of these patterns of, of uh, chemical use and exposure? So what I'm painting here is a, a picture of what I think of as fractured uh, science and fractured law. <clears throat> so that the legal authority for pesticides is now broken into uh, three different bureaus, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, that is responsible for tolerance setting, but also toxicity testing. The Food and Drug Administration is responsible for detecting residues in the food supply. And the Department of Agriculture is responsible for the enforcement of these statutes in meat and poultry, and also for the assessment of economic benefits associated with uh, producing the nation's food supply. So you've got these different agencies with different legal mandates, and they tend not to talk to one another. <clears throat> so that the, uh, in Great Britain, they've created a, a new food safety organization that uh, is really quite uh, distinctive as a model. They had the same fractured pattern of bureaucratic control in Great Britain, and uh, they decided that, that uh, they would consolidate that. They'd centralize the authority in one group. And it's, it's very curious because uh, by doing that, 
it, it has allowed conservative administrations uh, to slow down regulation and to become less environmentally protective uh, much more quickly than if the authority is, is diffused among different agencies. So this is a very interesting kind of a problem. <coughs> The primary authority for tolerance setting was taken away from the Department of Agriculture, just like the authority for regulating nuclear power uh, was taken away from the Atomic Energy Commission. <clears throat> so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was created. So you don't, you don't want the producer and the protector of the public interest to be sitting inside the same organization. That's really the key principle. For those of you that I uh, haven't stunned uh, to death uh, enough uh, with this lecture so far, uh, if you want to know more about pesticide science and history and law, I published this book uh, uh, about 10 years ago. And this really details the, the uh, de description of, of how we discovered uh, that uh, kids were more exposed to many different pesticides than adults uh, that uh, 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 was eventually adopted into the Food Quality Protection Act passed in, in 1996. So that this law was designed to, to deal with this uh, problem of, of risk being not equally distributed in society. And it included a, a new general safety standard. It did away with the risk-benefit balancing standard. And it said, OK, instead, uh, uh, EPA must make its choices uh, based upon the phrase reasonable certainty of no harm. It's kind of interesting. If you were, if you were given the assignment to, to uh, uh, include a decision standard in a statute that was health protective, uh, what would you choose? Would you choose a balancing standard? Probably not. Uh, would you choose the Delaney Clause model, which is a zero risk standard? You might. Uh, would you choose a standard such as this, reasonable certainty of no harm? Well, you can imagine that this is hammered out politically uh, in, in Congress with great uh, interest on the part of chemical companies and also uh, uh, food manufacturers to try to understand what its implications might be for them. It also requires a finding of safety. This had not been part of the law. <laughs> until 1996. So EPA must now find that uh, uh, chemicals are safe for children. This is really quite uh, new and striking. Uh, and it requires a tenfold additional safety factor to account for uncertainty in the data that they have as they set their limits. So that this idea of a buffer zone, if you think the risk is X, uh, then you have to allow X over what uh, <clears throat> in order to set your standard for exposure. Well, is it, uh, do you want a tenfold safety factor? Uh, do you want a hundredfold, a thousandfold? Well, the tradition had been to use a hundredfold safety factor. So if you think that this is what it is, you account for your, your absence of knowledge or your ignorance by dividing the allowable level by a hundred. And in this case, Congress said that's not good enough. You have to divide it by an additional 10 to account for the uncertainty about uh, the, the di distributional patterns. And also the issue of, of some groups being more susceptible to these chemicals than, than others. <clears throat> it also required that the agency for the first time uh, needed to consider how people might be ex exposed to the same chemical, uh, not just from, from uh, food uh, or uh, <clears throat> different crops, uh, but food, drinking water, uh, and other kinds of environments. So the same chemical might be sprayed on uh, fruits and vegetables and, and might get into dairy cattle, uh, but it also might be sprayed in your apartment building. Uh, or it also might be uh, used as an algicide in a, in a swimming pool. Uh, so that uh, formerly EPA had just kind of given out licenses as USDA had to these different uh, allowable uses and <clears throat> not thought about the fact that to somebody as they basically walk through their daily life uh, could be exposed to the same chemical uh, across, across these environmental compartments, so to speak. So the idea of aggregate risk is new. <clears throat> and it's an attempt to think about uh, uh, the complexity of the way that these compounds can move through uh, uh, environments. The idea of cumulative risk is also new. Uh, that, that the government had to consider the idea that uh, you know, a group of chemicals might act the same way in the human body, and the risk might be at least additive, if not uh, uh, synergistic. So for the first time uh, in 1996, EPA had to review all of its tolerances to, to think about this issue of cumulative risk. And the pace of review was also sped up so that all chemicals that uh, it had licensed had to be reviewed by 2006. Uh, that was accomplished, you know, quite remarkably. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the critique I could give you of, of the quality of the uh, review is, is a different matter. Uh, and finally, uh, Congress directed the agency 
uh, not to give equal attention to every pesticide, but to come through to, or to develop some sort of a strategy to, to concentrate and focus on chemicals that it thought uh, would be the most risky. So how would you do that? How would you define the most risky chemicals? Well, you'd try to find those that had the highest uh, dose response rate. In other words, they seemed like they were the most potent uh, or the most toxic. But you'd also probably want to concentrate on chemicals that were persistent, chemicals that got into different environmental compartments, or chemicals that were used in, in uh, <coughs> food or, or uh, environments that people freak, uh, frequent, foods that people eat a lot of, or environments that uh, uh, were, were highly frequented, such as uh, uh, schools or, or uh, uh, such as uh, uh, occupational settings or, or, or homes. Uh, so the idea of strategic attention to the most toxic chemicals is an, an important concept. So <coughs> uh, what's happened here? as you think back across history, you've got kind of a sequence uh, of changing regulatory priorities. And you might ask yourself, well, why is that? So the first attempt back in, in, in 1906 was to protect the economy of farmers against fraudulent labeling. Uh, and then the obligation uh, became to protect food and, and uh, crop uses. So set limits uh, for levels of residue in, in different kinds of uh, foods. Uh, then wildlife, wildlife re residues became extremely important as people worried about uh, how chemicals were uh, causing decline in, in species that uh, were really uh, much loved in the United States, uh, particularly large raptors, uh, bald eagles, uh, the national uh, symbol or the golden eagle, uh, the peregrine falcon, uh, ospreys that uh, now uh, you can see coming back uh, along the shoreline here in Connecticut. If you take the train from New Haven up to Boston, for example, and look out over the salt marshes, you'll see these poles uh, sitting in the middle of salt marshes with ospreys. Ospreys came very close to extinction because of, of the chemical DDT that was building up in its, its body and causing its eggshells to thin, uh, so its reproductive success declined. Soil contamination became important uh, as instances where a chemical had been used in the field one year and had persisted in that field. Uh, another tenant farmer comes along the next year and plants a different crop that crop is not uh, permitted to have that chemical used on it, but it absorbed the chemical up through uh, its roots uh, and becomes adulterated. So that failure to think about soil contamination was causing uh, some foods to become adulterated in ways that were not predictable. And drinking water contamination has come late to the attention of the Environmental Protection Agency. Why would that be? You know, if you think about water uh, as one of the most consumed foods in the human diet, why wouldn't the government have paid more attention to water? <clears throat> Also think about indoor environments. Uh, I've come to believe that uh, all of the attention given to food uh, is, is really probably misplaced uh, relative to exposures that occur in indoor environments. So that uh, in many uh, situations today, uh, people can be in rooms uh, when they are sprayed by a licensed applicator. So the exposures that occur after that uh, often are far, far higher than the uh, exposures that come from foodborne residues. Uh, the idea that the susceptible need, need attention, this is new in environmental law uh, as of 1996, and new areas uh, that uh, deserve additional attention that, that uh, I think are extremely important is, is the use of, of uh, these chemicals uh, uh, as they're impregnated into a variety of consumer products. So, you know, if you're, uh, if you're hiking uh, long distances, you may want a pesticide impregnated into the fabric that you buy <coughs> if you uh, don't have an opportunity to, to wash your, uh, your clothes. Uh, but what, what does that mean? Uh, there are a whole new array of, of products in the marketplace now that, that uh, carry these residues uh, for obvious functions such as, as uh, durability, keeping them to, uh, from degrading. Uh, pesticides are added to paints, for example, to keep uh, the, the bacteria in paint from breaking it down and chipping and, and causing you to have to, uh, to uh, you know, repaint in, in a short period of time. So that the functional side of, of, of these chemicals used in consumer products is pretty well understood. Uh, but the long-term implications for uh, environmental quality and human health uh, really are not. So the underlying problems here include the human inability to sense chemical risk. You know, we basically don't know where these chemicals are in our environment because we can't see them, we can't taste them, uh, we can't feel them. We have to, uh, we have to imply where they are uh, by, uh, by proxy. Uh, thinking about, gee, you know, I live next, I'm, I'm living on a track of land uh, and I've got a well and this used to be a farmland. Maybe I ought to test my drinking water. 
uh, or I'm living next to a, a field that is, plant, that is uh, planted with a, a crop that's routinely sprayed by a, a, a plane that flies over. Maybe the drift is, is getting into my, uh, into my uh, environment. So that thinking about uh, uh, where these things are in the environment really uh, demands a certain level of background literacy and knowledge uh, that often is not present. <clears throat> the underlying problem of lack of sensitivity to, to susceptibility is really important. Uh, who's susceptible? Well, the, the very youngest are. Uh, now remember that all of these concentrations are measured how? They're expressed per unit of your body weight. So when in life uh, does a human have the lowest body weight? In utero, first trimester. So if the concentration in the mom is the same uh, moving across the placenta as the concentration in the fetus, and you get to an exposure estimate by taking that concentration and dividing it by body weight, and the mom's body weight might be 160 pounds, and the fetus's body weight might be a quarter of a pound. I'm sorry, sorry Laura, about this. <laughs> you get the idea. The same concentration in the environment affects the fetus much more than it would uh, the average adult. So this has really transformed the way that uh, government regulators have begun to think about chemical management. We've had poor monitoring of chemical release. Uh, we have thought much more about chemical persistence and environmental fate having learned from strontium-90 and the DDT story. Uh, and we've under, misunderstood variability in human exposure. Uh, still, we're not putting monitors on individual people, although increasingly the government is, is uh, monitoring human tissue, taking blood and, and urine uh, and uh, hair samples to try to figure out you know, what, the, what the matrix of chemicals uh, might be that, that an individual is exposed to. So looking not just by uh, uh, sampling in the marketplace, uh, but looking uh, at, at this pattern uh, by taking human tissue samples, this is a whole new wave uh, that's giving people the opportunity, literally, to go to a doctor and say, I want to be measured for uh, this entire array of chemicals. So it may cost you uh, a couple thousand dollars to go through that process, but increasingly people are doing this, trying to make some sense out of the way that they feel, uh, their medical condition, and uh, environmental quality. Single chemical exposure is still the focus of government. No company wants its chemical to be compared to another company when, the, when uh, uh, they're making a regulatory choice. <clears throat> Toxicity testing is incomplete in a variety of areas, uh, especially uh, relative to the immune system. And you know the rise in allergies that uh, we're experiencing, uh, severe allergies. Uh, more people are walking around with EpiPens today because of of uh, <clears throat> uh, worries about anaphylaxis than ever before. Something is happening to the human immune system. It's not clear why, but many of the chemicals that are released, such as some pesticides, uh, do influence the human immune system. That's one example of a, an area of human health that has been neglected by, by the government. Uh, also, the uh, endocrine of, uh, effects are, are quite uh, uh, misunderstood. The, the uh, uh, behavior of these chemicals as human hormones that we'll speak about uh, a bit next week. Uh, also, failure of labeling as a management strategy. Labeling is still the dominant approach that EPA takes to try to inform the public, uh, to educate the public how they might be able to use these economic poisons uh, in a safe way. But you need to think about whether or not that's really a potentially effective way of controlling these kinds of risks. And we're also misunderstanding uh, trends in human illness. Uh, we, for example, uh, we had no asthma registry in Connecticut until uh, 2003. So we couldn't figure out uh, whether or not uh, uh, people that lived in areas that had higher uh, levels of air pollution uh, were more likely to have asthma. So the absence of, of surveillance of, of health conditions uh, makes it impossible to correlate uh, these exposures uh, to health outcomes. And finally, uh, variance in human capacity to manage risk. There's a real environmental justice here issue, uh, that, that needs to be paid attention to, that there are many members of society uh, that do not have the capacity uh, to, to get the education necessary to self-manage risk, uh, so that uh, some people uh, uh, simply are more reliant on government standard setting than, than other people are. So these are all underlying problems of law, uh, and all of them are pretty well exemplified uh, by this history of, of pesticide uh, 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 management. Okay, that's it for today, and uh, we'll come back on Tuesday. Have a great weekend.